Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Colonel Mike Warlick, U.S. Marine Corps retired, Vice President, Defense AFCA International. That was a test. We wanted to see how quiet you could be for more than a minute. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and I hope, but I hope you didn't enjoy it too much, because we've got a great panel ahead of you here now. Uh, this morning you heard General Fogarty. Uh, most of you have seen him with a whiteboard today. That was a rare occasion not to see him with a whiteboard, but he was just as driven and enter entertaining and right as he possibly could be in his presentation. Also this morning, we had a PEO CFT session over at the Cyber Center. Uh, this is the second PEO session we've had this week. It went very well. Full house, lots of good questions. And uh, you might get a, a touch of a follow-up here at this upcoming uh, uh, panel. And you also heard about Thunderdome with uh, Major General Yi, uh, which provided another uh, different and maybe new slant uh, to the future uh, that uh, may be looked at within the DISA organization. Again, I'm Mike Warlick, and good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's now time to get this panel in session, and it really is my pleasure to introduce our, our moderator this afternoon, Major General Maria Barrett, Commanding General, U.S. Army Network Enterprise Technology Command. She's no stranger to this event or many others, and, and she's looking ahead even while she's here this week, I'm sure. General Barrett is a uh, New England uh, native and was commissioned at, at ROTC at Tufts University. She's commanded at the company, battalion, and brigade level. At, as network commander, uh, General Barrett leads global operations for the Army's portion of the Doden, ensuring freedom of action in cyberspace while denying the same to our adversaries. Please join me in welcoming Ma Major General Barrett and her panel. All right, we on? Okay, good. Uh, so first of all, I wanna thank FCA for hosting this panel because for the five of us that you see here, usually this is a bi-weekly Teams meeting. <laughs> and um, I was, I was um, surprised to find out how big Mr. Sachs was. <laughs> <laughs> He's much taller than he looks in Teams. So thank you for bringing us together. Um, that, but I do, we do actually get together. Uh, the network CFT hosts a bi-weekly uh, where we start talking about, the, we're talking about the Army modernization and how all of us are, are bringing um, our organizations uh, to making that a reality. And so within the framework of implementing the U unified network, I think this is just very appropriate that we're, no, we're not strangers to this at all. Um, I'm going to make a few comments and uh, then I'm going to um, let each one of the panelists introduce themselves and then we'll come back and save most of the time for Q&A. Uh, one of the things that I hope you noticed um, over the last day and a half through the comments made, um, especially by Gerald Morrison, is that there has been probably an absence, maybe a couple slips, uh, where we have not talked about the integrated tactical network, the integrated enterprise network, IEN, ITN. We're not talking about the mission network, the operational network. Uh, we may have slipped a little bit in referring to the enterprise, uh, but a lot of foot stomping on the unified network. And you may be wondering why that is. Um, can we go to the next slide? And Bill? Build? Okay, there. Shameless ripoff of a Gary Larson cartoon. Uh, you'll notice the big burly guys on one side of the boat um, have ITN on their shirts, and the skinny guys are the IEN. And at the front of the boat is the Omar, the leader, who's got the UNO boat, the Unified Network Operations. This is not the way we're going to row on this. <laughs> <laughs> this, will not, this model will not work, and we will go in circles. Okay, build. We don't want to look at Gary Larson for the whole thing. Okay, next. There we go. It disappeared. Um, but the, the need for this is very real. Um, you know, about a year or so ago, uh, we did an AER for uh, a deployment, 
And um, one of the comments made by 182 BCT was uh, they, they deployed and uh, as soon as they arrived at the other end, um, they wanted to join the net, Nipper network in, in SWA and they had to re-image the computers. We've heard this for a long time. And so in the AER comment, uh, the, the statement was we need a standardized, um, seamless, end-to-end -end network. And I just stared at my computer at this AER and I said, my golly, we have wanted this for so long. I'm looking at General Lawrence, I'm looking at General Knapper, and I know they've sat in this seat and we've wanted this for so long. What has stopped us from getting there? And so we're, we're gonna go after that, right? I will tell you that the folks who, who ha are leaving CONUS locations today now have the opportunity to join a network and not re-image. Matter of fact, they can have all their files from home station. We're gonna do this. Now it's a workaround right now, but the vision of the unified network, this is a purposeful architecture that we are building to. And so that's how I wanna start today off. And with that, um, we will go down the line and we will do introductions and I'll start with you, Chief. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is uh, Chief Warrant Officer 5, Danny Burns. I'm assigned to the Army G6 as the Chief Technology Officer. Um, it's an exciting time to be in the Army right now, especially to be a part of the Signal and Cyber Corps. Uh, you heard yesterday General Martin say during the opening remarks, the Army's in a transitional point and we're going to conduct operations and support multi-domain capable forces. You heard General Morrison say that that critical enabler is a transformation is the unified network. Unlike past efforts, we have an approved Army Requirements Operation Council requirement document for unified network operations that lays out the need to build a unified network from the tactical edge back to the enterprise to create one common network, one common transport core, and a common security architecture founded on zero trust principles that will enable the force to operate, maintain, secure and defend the unified network from end to end in a fight against a thinking adversary in a contested and congested environment. To do that, we're gonna be able, be able to move from the brigade to the division to the cores, seamlessly linking back to the enterprise where our modernization investments are supporting what we want our tactical formations to be doing in a multi-domain fight, which is apply effects across all echelons at the speed, the tempo, and with the violence necessary to successfully win against a peer or near peer adversary. The end state we're working towards is a set of unifying capabilities, leveraging industries, both emerging and mature technologies that can be seamlessly integrated for the operations, maintenance, and security of that unified network. Yes, ma'am. Jim Ray. Yeah. Okay, I hope I'm on. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, well, thanks everybody for being here. Very good, Jim Ray. Been on board for about 60 days as a network cross-functional team director been doing the assessment, kind of looking across. But I just came from CENCOM and uh, as the J6 there for the last 24 months and, you know, have seen and lived this not being able to connect when your forces get on the ground. And I got to see it, you know, firsthand. Uh, in order to, you know, build out this unified network, what we're going to need is to look at it from the edge. You have to come from the tactical side back to the strategic environment. There's a, there's a, there's a bro broken line in there. Talk to Joe Morrison and the rest of the team about this all the time. There's a broken line between the enterprise and the tactical, which is that you get into that unified uh, environment. And that's fundamentally what we have to close that gap right now. And the thing about it is if we don't get this right, What's happening on the battlefield today is that the soldiers, if we don't get it right, and we don't get the capabilities right on the ground that they need in order to prosecute and execute on targets, they're gonna go around us. I usually refer to it to the team as, they're gonna buy a new lawnmower and they're gonna go cut the grass. And it's our duty, everyone in here, industry and everybody collectively, to figure out, help us figure this out, how we can close this gap. That gap has to be closed sooner rather than later so we can win the next fight in MDO 
so we can be ready by 2028 and we can be capable by 2035. So that's the task that's been given to me from the tactical side of the house, to close that gap, build that security architecture that General Morrison spoke about yesterday. Building that security architecture, I'm working with POC3T, Nick, the team, Joan Collins, we're all working collectively to build that security architecture so we can provide it to everyone, our industry partners, to help us get to the end state. Because it's gonna take everyone to help work and get there. How I look at it is the future calls for data. You heard everyone speak about it. Data is important to the commanders down at the edge. And so as we close that gap across the board, we gotta be data-centric, no more network-centric environments. We can't take that network with us on our back to the edge. We have to think about those cloud instances around the world. We gotta use transport agnostic environment to get to it. Leo, Mio, all those platforms that are out there, and our systems have to be smart enough to get after it when we build out this unified network across the board. We're gonna to continue to use soldier touch points to inform this, and we're gonna experiment on it on the way there. And the PEOs, and we all together collectively will, will do that. But to get to that unified network, definitely need to be in a data-centric environment. We gotta have identity management and ABAC across the board to help us get there as well, so that we know using zero trust architecture, like the chief said, in order to get there. So I look forward to your questions. And this is a team of teams. You see it right here, this is a team of teams and we're gonna get there. And each and every one of you out there is part of that team as well. So I look forward to your questions, thanks. Mr. Sachs. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, ma'am, one of my big takeaways from my time here is I need to change my team's background when I get back to work and put one of those uh, mugshot things up behind me so everyone can see how tall I am. But, um, yeah. So, so my, my name's Nick Sachs. I'm the acting deputy PEO for PEOC3T. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you all today. Um, we're making great strides within CEO, PEO C3T, excuse me, um, executing our capability set strategy. Uh, while it's focused on the tactical network, that capability set strategy does support the unified network plan. Um, General Morrison talked a little bit yesterday about optimizing the network being a part of the, the, the um, unified network plan. We are delivering increased uh, uh, transport capabilities. We're upgrading our mission command applications, and we're also integrating MPE. Um, additionally, we're currently prototyping and operationally assessing our mobile and survivable command posts. So while, while we're doing a lot, uh, fielding a lot in, in Cape Set 21, we're also looking forward to Capability Set 23. We're currently designing that capability set with a critical design review in April of 22. Cape Set 23 is gonna lay the foundation for us to implement a data fabric. And that, that's critically important because that data fabric is going to allow us to move data across the all echelons of the unified network between tactical and enterprise. So it'll give the commander the information he or she needs wherever they need it and when they need it. We're gonna leverage uh, best of breed technologies from Army, s and and industry. We're leveraging COTS, NDI, and um, open data sources to expand capabilities in ingress, egress, persistence, and synchronization. So the, the CS23 data fabric will deliver basic analytics. It's going to have an initial edge cloud computing capability and we're looking to leverage uh, API infrastructures. Everything needs to, to work together. We can't have stovepipes as we build out the data fabric. Looking forward uh, to CS25, uh, we're gonna introduce um, some, some advanced analytics using AI and ML uh, have more robust edge cloud computing capabilities and really expand the capabilities of, of ingress, egress, and persistence. So again, the, the, the whole point of what we're doing in PEOC 3T is, is um, optimizing and modernizing the tactical network, tactical transport, in order to enable that, that unified network and, and allow data to flow between tactical and enterprise side. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Guckert to speak from the enterprise perspective. Thanks, Nick. Um, hey, had some great sessions with industry this week. Um, look forward to the additional sessions later today. 
Uh, everything from novel smart routers to automated UAM um, activity monitoring. But I'm really excited about what I think the future of uh, network modernization looks like because quite frankly, I think we've been doing tech refreshes at the camps, posts, and stations. We really haven't been truly modernizing them and I think this strategy really gets at it. So uh, just for context, uh, we are PEO EIS. We do the enterprise part of the network, the IEN that General Barrett mentioned. There's the ITN piece, so those two need to connect to form the unified network. That seamless, end-to-end, -end, one battle command, one mission command network, uh, that's the same network whether you're CONUS or OCONUS. We're considering very innovative approaches and investments in everything from 5G to Wi-Fi, commercial solutions for classified, soldier de software-defined networks, zero trust, ICAM, DCO, and regionalized and globalized SIPR, just to name a few. Uh, a lot of pilots uh, have occurred or are going to be ongoing to inform the strategy. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with ITAS, um, which has been curtailed, but we are learning a lot with the three sites we're continuing. Um, we are fielding sites and piloting sites uh, in FY22, and NETCOM has made a number of investments and activities ongoing that are going to inform that strategy as well. So a lot going on to inform that strategy, and you heard General Morrison talk about the XORD that's going to be coming out, followed by a, a detailed implementation plan and a strategy. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about at EIS is the first time we're going to have a multi-year strategy to answer those, those five W's for us. You know, what posts are we going to touch in what year? How are we going to touch them? And so it's, it's going to be resource informed, but it allows us to focus more on just an annual priorities list. It's a multi-year um, predictive funding, uh, predictive strategy that we can plan better for uh, from a contracting perspective, from an acquisition perspective. Uh, it's a, you heard it many times, it's a collective effort. It must be a collective effort if we're going to be successful. So it's the CIO, the G6, our cyber, setting the conditions and establishing the vision. It's the PEOs, it's NETCOM, it's the network CFT supporting the delivery of that capability. It's the cyber center of excellence codifying the formal requirements for us. Collective effort. And finally, it's industry. Uh, probably, uh, I said it many times, the most critical partner uh, if we're going to accomplish this. We are positioning ourselves within the PEO to move as fast as the funding and the strategy will allow. So adaptive, flexible contracts to pivot and adjust as the strategy adjusts. We know the strategy is going to adjust as we learn things from the piloting. Uh, so we're putting ourselves in a position to move out as quickly as possible using the tools in our tool bag. Uh, General Morrison talked about the IT box, a great resource, very powerful tool. Um, if you think about what I can push down to my 06 PMs that are executing that, that have a funding ceiling, and whether it's three, five years, they're, really, they're able to push out increments of capability as long as they stay within that funding ceiling. They don't have to come to me for approval. They don't have to go to my boss for approval. They have it at their level. Very powerful, very effective, and very fast. Um, OTAs, agile approach, DevSecOps, incremental development, minimum viable solutions, all those things are in our toolbox that we're putting into place to make sure we utilize so we can deliver this capability as fast as we can. Now, I'll just close with uh, a number of times this week, I've got asked a question from industry, how can we support you? So I turn it back on them and say, how do you think you can support us? You know what our strategy, what our vision is here. We've been giving you some right and left limits. You know where the innovation is. You know where your investments are at. You know what we're trying to do. How can you support us? Come talk to us. And if you listen to me talk yesterday, you see that we meet with industry almost every work day of the year. And that's where we get that feedback, but that's just one venue. So I encourage you to come talk to us about how you think you can help us implement the Unified Network using that venue or other venues. We do industry days, we do RFIs, we do market research all the time. And venues like this, uh, thanks to the FCA. So great opportunity to come talk to us, tell us how you think you can help us uh, deliver the unified network for MDO operations. Thank you. Cool. So with that, since you ended with the MDO note,
Um, I want to take this back. We don't have a network just for the sake of having a network. We have a network for the sake of operations. And so I'd ask um, General Ray, you know, can you first, let's set, set the environment right now. How does the unified network support the Army's modernization, the 31 plus four uh, initiatives? Yes, ma'am, uh, good question. So, you know, before I answer the question, I used to say, back when I was a major, I used to say the network is the most important thing. I really didn't know what I was saying at that time, but I was just saying it, right? I would tell folks, I mean, if you ask folks, I was just saying the network is the most important thing. I mean, back in World War II and Vietnam, you know, the shooter was really important on the ground, not to discount the shooter on the ground, but the fact that today the network is the fundamental connective tissue for all those different uh, CFTs that we currently have work in the modernization effort. And so the, the network is the fundamental underbelly of what we're trying to achieve here. And the critical long range fires, uh, uh, next gen vehicles, all those particular CFTs that are working those projects between the PEO and the CFT we're working directly with them so we can understand their requirements in order to connect their requirements for the network from a network perspective, uh, their, their capabilities to the network itself. And you know, then give that command of that picture across the board, that single pane of glass that we've been talking about. But they really have to understand you know, what is that architecture going to look like, what that capability is going to look like from a uni unified perspective. Again, getting to MDO ready in 2028, MDO capable by 2035, it is important that they understand that strategy so they know exactly what they need to do while they're building out their modernization efforts as well. So I'll stop there, ma'am, and see if there's any additional uh, questions to branch off that. No, but I, I would take that and then pivot to you, Chief, as the senior technical advisor to the G6, what do you see as the foundational technologies that will underpin the unified network? Yes, ma'am. Uh, great opportunity today to see a lot of those technologies, yeah. walk, on the, walk on the industry floor, and I have a day and a half more to go see more of them. Um, I, see, I think you can talk forever about different technologies, but there's a couple of key ones that I think we have to just get right. Um, is, is leveraging industry emerging technologies for transport, like 5G, yeah. uh, Leo and Mio, and then being able to utilize those multiple transport services, uh, you know, via uh, SD-WAN so that we can connect users and applications. I think to be able to get after what General Ray was talking about earlier about a secure archi security architecture, the fundamental piece for zero trust principles and implementing something of that is gonna be, you know, identity credential access management. And if we don't get that set right, now, we're not gonna be successful moving forward as you try to um, present the, the architecture that we use for unifying the network. Right. So ma'am, those are, those are some of the um, ones that just come off the top of my head right now. So I didn't hear you talk about data, but Mr. Sachs, you talked about the data fabric and, and how important is that in data management to this effort? Ma'am, I, I think it's critically important. So, so as we build out different um, transport and have, have resilient transport options and, and um, you know, pace plans of how we're gonna communicate, the, it, it's critically important that we have a, a way to define the data and get it to where it needs to be. So I don't think we have a problem today that there's not enough data. I think we have plenty of data available to us. <laughs> I think the challenge today is, is we don't have um, the structure in place to to adequately tag the data or identify the data, exactly what, what, it, what it is, who needs to see it, when do they need to see it, prioritize it so we know what goes first. Um, I, think, I think we do some of that, but I think as we continue to build out our, our capability, we can, we, there's probably a lot of ways we can do that smarter and faster so that the, the data flows at a speed that's relevant. Well, can, I, can I expand on that a little sure. bit? Yeah, so from a data perspective, uh, I mean, coming from the COCOM, you know, the bottom line is in order to, to win the next fight and we fight with our partners is going to be sharing data. I understand we're building out the unified network. That's a, that's a big deal. But what, when we look at data and the structure of data and how we share data in the future, we always have to ensure that we have our partners as part of that piece. 
So, you know, if we're going to see JADC2 realized, it's going to be from an MPE perspective, a mission partner environment where we're sharing that data. And like Chief said, identity management, credentialing, all that is important, zero trust in order for our partners to, to get that data. But I believe that data in the future, how we create it, how we tag it, how we standardize it is important going forward. If we continue to create data in the manner that we are, whether it's sensing data, intel data, it doesn't matter, we're gonna be in the same place we've been in for the last four decades that I've been in the Army. And I just talked to folks about it. Some of you might say, what? Yes, I've been in the Army for four decades coming up <laughs> in two years. And I see the same exact thing. The, and, and I'm talking to industry partners too. You're, you're selling us the same exact things I had 40 years ago when I was a private. I want us to look at this differently. We have to look at it differently. We have to structure it differently. We have to get to the cloud environment. We have to secure it. We have to, that transport agnostic environment is key. I don't take my tactical Gmail to the field, but I still get to it when I'm there. So help me figure this out. I really need everyone's help on this. This unified network is, network is right around the corner, but I need all the help. So what both of you just talked about, sometimes I'll hear you know, leaders talk about, well, there's the enterprise cloud and the tactical cloud. You, you talk very passionately about data. Data knows no boundaries in terms of whether we're talking about the strategic, operational, or tactical layer. And so I'm gonna go down to Mr. Guckert. And, and, and we've had conversations about this as a group but I'd like you to kind of maybe, before we go to audience questions, touch on how do you think this is gonna work in terms of, or what are your ideas about, how do we stay synchronized? Because what we heard passionately about from these two gentlemen um, is also something that your team's working on and a host of other initiatives that we will be seeing as part of the unified network. And so how do you see this synchronization between the PEOs working? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and we've actually been getting the question ever since the UNO ICD came out. Um, and, and I'll just answer that PEOs have been doing coordination for decades across portfolios. And if you think about how we deliver platforms like Abrams Tanks, like Bradley's, like Apache's and Chinook's, they're not delivered by 1 p.m., right? They have critical enablers that go on them, the sensors, the radios, and the others that takes a, a collective effort across PEOs to define the system's architecture, the system's engineering process to ultimately deliver an integrated capability. So it's no different here. We're gonna work closely with C3T, the network CFT, IWS, those key P PEOs that are players uh, to deliver the unified network. So we'll come together. Uh, we've had discussions, General Collins and I already, um, about what does the governance look like and what are the products that we have to deliver. Things like reference architectures, APIs, how do we come together and do proofs of concepts and different exercises to prove that the, the capability is working. Um, how do we look at contracts um, and testing and scalability of solutions. How do we do all of that together to deliver that integrated solution. So those conversations are occurring. Um, they're not new to PEOs, I guess is my point. We do it all the time, and we'll continue to do that. I have no doubt that we'll be successful in that endeavor. Cool. So I think by now we probably have a few audience questions. Um, I hope we do. Yes, we do. <gasps> in the context of the unified network, where do you see edge computing being located on the battlefield, and how do we balance the keeping complexity above the battalions while still making access resilient in a DDIL environment. Yeah, I'd ask either General Ray or yeah, Mr. Yeah, Sachs to take that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I could take that one. Um, edge computing is going to is going to be important. Um, the data at the edge is still going to be important when we're in that disconnected environment or that that D that DDL environment. So it's still going to be important for us to have some of the data available uh, to uh, our warfighters at the edge. Uh, but it doesn't discount that it's still an environment where we need data to be in a cloud environment that they can reach to it, that they're not taking the entire network with them at the edge in order to compute. We still want them to be able to reach to the data. 
we, have, we want those transport agnostic environments that we would like them to reach back to their data, but we do know and we do understand that they will need enough data at the edge in order to still conduct their operations. So it's important to have it there still. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's one of those um, kind of it depends questions, right? So it really depends on, on, on mission and, and what applications are needed about, about what and how much computing is needed at the edge and how far the edge is. And, and so it's somewhat mission specific. So from a PEO perspective, working with the CFT and the various ACMs, you know, we want to make sure we understand those CONOPS and, and mission requirements so that we can uh, deliver solutions that gives the commander flexibility to, to take different, they, they may take different solutions to the edge at different times depending on what the mission is. So, so we want to make sure we maximize the flexibility we give the operational units. Uh, so it's important that we work closely with, with the user representatives, get feedback from the users as we, as we develop and, and experiment with the equipment and, and just make sure we're all nested closely together. We discuss updating post camps and stations, but never discuss updating National Guard armored or U.S. Army Reserve Centers. Is there an integrated plan along with the Compo 1 plan to update these facilities where a significant amount of our forces are located? You want me to take that? You can. <laughs> so I, I, did, I got asked that question yesterday, and um, I think it's a great question. Uh, right, right now, our mission and what we're funded for is the camps, posts, and the stations. Um, I think uh, the gentleman I was talking to yesterday indicated there's, there's funding to modernize uh, those um, locations as well. Um, there probably needs to be a discussion about um, some alignment and synchronization as we do that. And uh, I'm going to take that back as an action to understand how we do that and who the players are and understand um, the, who sets those priorities, because um, it won't be the material developer, but we'll end up delivering it at some point. But how we can at least be aligned as those capabilities get delivered. And so I'm going to take that back as an action. Thanks. I, I do think there's more potential there as we take a look at taking um, advantage of um, gray network opportunities to connect them uh, securely for their mission. We might, there might be some prioritization in terms of locations, uh, but I do think with some of the things that we've been talking about, um, the cybernet modernization, taking advantage of that, transport agnostic, um, technologies, you know, this is where I do think this opens up the aperture, although we do have to put it into the plan, um, you know, so good question. Yep. Converge Unifies Networks is not just a technology problem, it's also a policy and procedural problem between various Army components. What's being done to address these challenges? I, I actually, I'm going to take the first stab at that. Um, I, there does need to be a framework for how we are going to fight this network uh, end to end. If you are going to converge this, make it seamless, um, and, and flatten certain things out, we do have to re-envision the roles and responsibilities at Echelon. General Morrison spent a good amount of time yesterday talking about raising complexity up. Um, that moves some people's cheese, that's okay, uh, but we do have to spend some time um, taking a look at that. One of the things that we've done in Netcom is we've given ourselves a task uh, to rewrite or write a, what we call a Dodenops framework at ech for each echelon. We've been through a couple Defender Europe exercises where we have uh, many uh, core and below units flowing in. Um, the, the battlefield gets pretty um, congested in terms of command and control of the network. Um, add the cyber piece into it and it gets even um, uh, more confusing. So I think we owe it to do this, come up with a framework. We're, when we're done with it, we're gonna deliver it to CCOE um, and then hopefully then we'll be able to make that something that is promulgated across the force uh, for both the, for the cyber operational forces. And that's inclusive of the signal organizations and, and the cyber defenders who maneuver on in this blue space. 
so I, that's, that's one of the major ways that we will uh, deal with the convergence piece. The other parts of the convergence are, hey, if we are going to go to a single service provider, um, we do need to uh, think through um, as we converge organizational networks and, and flatten things out, especially on the enterprise side, uh, when, when do you off-ramp, um, you know, this organization's how they were doing business, uh, how do we make the licenses more uniform in terms of what we're using, um, if that is an issue that we've seen, or not an issue, but if that is part of our survey, when do we do any sort of transfer of funds? When do we change the OpCon relationship uh, in terms of now you're, you know, if Chief Burns was running a, a network for an organization, I'd say, okay, now you're gonna start getting your cyber tasking orders from me and I'll tell you how to configure, it, configure the network uh, according to the latest that we're getting from JFHQ Doden. Uh, so we are, we're actually in the middle of doing some of those things, um, but as we gain some acceleration with the OrgNet convergence, we'll see more of that. And I don't know if anybody else has anything to add. I have something to add. I think um, General Ray mentioned it earlier. It's a team effort, and one of the team members that's not on the panel is the CIO. Yep. Um, and as General um, Barrett mentioned, we do sync on a regular basis, and these are some of the tough questions that we're asking as we're making cultural changes in the Army and how we're gonna do business, what policies need to be affected, and how are we gonna implement that to ensure, as we are, as you said, moving the cheese, uh, we're still making sure we have that effectiveness and that operational mindset so that we, the maneuvers commanders can do their job and what we're doing on the back end to enhance that capability is not being affected. And I'll just say that, you know, as we share information with our partners, policies are gonna to have to change. I mean, CDSs are very nice, cross domains are very nice, but they're very cumbersome at the same time. And in order to work below the secret releasable environment from a, a mission partner environment, is gonna ask for policy changes. As we unify the network, uh, it's gonna require policy changes. As General Stanton spoke about bringing, you know, TS data from the enterprise is not the same structure of TS data that's gonna be required at the edge. It's gonna be completely different. We're still usable information from that TS data at the at the enterprise, but we still have to have policies that's gonna allow us to move that information across all those levels all the way down to the edge and still have our you know, warfighter execute on those commands. So that's gonna be a policy shift as well. How do you envision data sharing in a mission partner environment? You guys probably heard me talk about that many times. I'm sure John Barrett will look for them. Take it, Jeff. So, do you, do you want to go to the ISRMC yeah. first? No, I'm just kidding. That's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a joke. So again, I, I just came from CENTCOM where one of the big things we were working with the other COCOMs was on sharing information. But the key that we found out as we talk, I spoke to each of the different COCOMs was we cannot utilize the CDS anymore. The CDS was very cumbersome. And information was being held in the CDS uh, and not making it to the end user in order for them to execute on the information. So policy was changed in order for us to look at working below the secret releasable environment, Sabre, for us to work below that. And we did get USDI to work with us to kind of get there and so MPCO and all the SAFAA folks in the Air Force who's working the MPE efforts, uh, we are, it, you will see it take place if you have an opportunity to be at um, Bowl Quest 21, they will show a little bit of what will take place in the mission partner environment of the future as far as sharing information. Again, it's, it's grounded on identity management, access um, control, and so it's there. That's really the framework of it and how we create data in the future. And, I, and I'll, I'll just add to that from a, from a PEO perspective. We agree with everything General Ray said and we, we wanna make sure, I'll touch on it again, that we're delivering systems that are flexible enough to, to execute those various rule sets. So 
So uh, I talked earlier about how important um, structuring the data and, and is in order to be able to move the data where it needs to be, but, uh, but also that we have uh, hardware and software in place that's flexible enough to um, execute those different rule sets to, to move the data uh, to our mission partner environment, or mission partners, excuse me, over. So I encourage that there's recognition that industry plays a key role in implementation of the unified network and that an architecture is key understanding it. And, and knowing where your capability fits with that said, or with that said, can we expect to receive access to uni unified network architecture? We all missed the first part of the question, the so very it, first it's, phrase. It's, um, giving a recognition that industry plays a part in this. So how, um, how is industry going to be involved with uh, the rolling out of the architecture, and, and when are they going to be able to see the, oh, so yeah, pulled in? So it sounds like, okay, so uh, again, the PEO, C3T, and myself, the network cross-functional team, we're working on the security architecture that we're going to then be able to uh, allow industry and everyone else to uh, get an idea of you know, what our thought process is from that security architecture perspective. And I think that will allow them to go out and help support uh, the way forward for, the, for creating the unified, uh, the um, ITN back to the unified network. That was our final, that was our final question for the panel. Please welcome Mike Warlick back to the stage to thank them on behalf of AFSIA and our audience and offer some closing remarks. We talk about a quick ending. Uh, panel, Ross, Nick, Jeff, Chief, Major General Barrett, uh, thank you for bringing uh, to, the, to the discussion level the implementation of the unified network and, and uh, the ways we're going to get there. I think one thing I heard over the last two days is industry has been asking the PEOs uh, what they need. And I've heard this come up probably, I don't know, five times, give or take, over the last two days. But then I heard the PEOs come back and tell them, you, you tell me what you can provide. You tell me how you can do it. Uh, so I think that's yeah, you should take that to heart, industry. Uh, come, come, to, come to the government with your solutions. Uh, another thing that this panel uh, brought to me uh, was the talent that we have within the PEO establishment uh, and the, the commands, uh, and as, as well as, as the, the looking at the future and how the, the government, might, government might get there. Uh, all in all, uh, I'd like to say thank you for this panel. Thank you for your professionalism. Thank you for what you're doing for our country. And uh, thank you for being here this week in all these uh, strange circumstances we're in. How about a big round? And I'd like the panel to stay fast for just a minute. We've got the final panel coming up this afternoon. It's a women's panel. It's a, it's a, a cyber leadership panel which will discuss the artificial intelligence and other cyber challenges, uh, and, and that will be followed by your favorite, a reception. Uh, it'll be on the, in the Riverwalk hallway area. Uh, the uh, panel will begin at 4 o'clock. Uh, it'll be right here, and uh, the reception will be immediately following. Uh, thanks again, panel, for your great uh, uh, session this afternoon. Thank you all for being here and being a great audience, and thank you for being at this conference and staying safe. Have a good afternoon.